Well, I'd like you to look at Galatians, the last paragraph of the last chapter in Galatians chapter 6. The last paragraph is just like the first paragraph in chapter 1. They are bookends that encase the books. Chapter 1, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what we preach to you, let him be anathema. You do not add to grace. In chapter 6, he's going to say, uh, speak about those false teachers and how uh, those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh try to compel you to be circumcised that they will not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. And he puts them in their place. That is how important it is for a church to have as its first fundamental that we are saved by faith plus nothing. That that's the first fundamental of Christianity. And Paul is going to call this idea uh, in verse 16, those who will walk by this rule. He's going to call it a rule, an apostolic edict, an, an, a injunction against Christianity that we do not add to the work of God. And so let's look at this end product, this final, uh, like taking a... Uh, Something and just screwing it on to the end that it, this is one cohesive unit on the grace of God. He says in verse 11, a kind of an odd verse, see with what large letters I am writing you with my own hand. Paul wrote with a large script from some kind of eye ailment or eye injury, apparently that he had. And he does this as a distinguishing mark. Paul would have taught are, ex are given his letter through what was called an amanuensis, a secretary. We know who one of the secretaries was in the book of Romans, I, Tertius, who write this letter, greet you in the Lord. Some fellow named Tertius, and Paul looked to him and said, hey, sign your name, friend. So he signed it down there. And so Paul apparently takes in verse 11 the pen from this amanuensis and said, I want to write this last paragraph that no one will doubt that this comes from the Apostle Paul. And so, he says in verse 11, see with what large letters I am writing. This is his John Hancock, that this is a real epistle. It is not what is called a pseudepigrapha, a false letter. And so, he says in verse 12, those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh, speaking to the false teachers, their motive was a good showing. They wanted prestige, to have lots of people in their movement. Their means, in verse 12, is in the flesh, at the end of verse 13, in your flesh, of a physical group of numbers that were there because they had done a fleshly edict, uh, beginning with circumcision and then the keeping of law in addition to faith. So Paul says their, their motive is prestige and their goal is to affect people in their flesh. When the Apostle Paul talked about his ministry in Romans 15, he said, uh, I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and by deed, to see men who came to confess Christ and then to be born again. That was Paul's boast of what God had done. These guys are saying, look at what we have done. And so they're looking for numbers. Howard Hendricks once said to us at seminary, I ask guys in the ministry, how's your church doing? And they say, we've got about 500. To which I say, 500 what? You don't just want numbers, but there's numbers of certain kinds of people. All that their answer on salvation is the grace of God alone. And all that you can look at their life and you can see they not only have imputed to them the righteousness of God through Christ, but they have imparted unto them the Holy Spirit of God that they live lives of regeneration. So that's what Paul looked for, the salvation and the sanctification of God. Look what God did. Well, these guys say, look what I did. And in verse 12, their reason that they were legal and not gracious is at the end of verse 12, that they would not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. 
Whenever you preach an apostolic gospel, the apostle Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 1.30. He said, Christ became unto us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption that as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Now that was Paul's gospel. How do we know the knowledge of what salvation is? Christ became unto us the wisdom of God. In the beginning was the word. He is the truth made known to us. So we didn't think our way through to the Trinity and the gospel. Christ appeared and he brought the truth to us. He became to us wisdom from God and righteousness. Leon McMinn is in heaven. You know why? Because the standard of getting into heaven is the righteousness of God, which he didn't have, but he received as a free gift from Christ. And so he is most assuredly in heaven. Christ became to him the righteousness of God. And he became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification. The reason that we have been born again and that we are changing as we go on in the Christian life is he became our sanctification. We did not just pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. He has given us new life and he has given us regeneration. He is our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification, and he became to us redemption. Whenever redemption is spoken of in the New Testament in a consecutive sense, this, 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 and redemption, it's speaking of our freeing from the final vestige of sin, the resurrection from the dead. And so Christ became the beginning, our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification, and someday he will take us home to be with him. It's all a work of God. Wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and the resurrection. Look what God did. And that's why we are in heaven. When we're there, we will take our crowns and cast them at his feet. And so that gospel is very intimidating. When you speak to people who figure that they have figured out who God is, that they have earned the righteousness that God requires, and they are going to face eternity with a cross, meaning their fingers crossed, they're very proud of how smart they are and good they are and strong they are and confident they are. And when you come with your cross, that the only way we can know of God is that Christ made himself known. And the only way we can be righteous is that he bestows it. The only way we can be changed is that he changes us. And the only reason we will stand in glory is that he will mediate for us and he will raise us from the dead. Who now gets all the glory? Christ. Who gets all the benefit? We do. And so whenever you preach that to a group of self-righteous people, that is not, uh, that is the, the offense of the cross. And so Paul said, they add works to this to take away the offense of the cross. If you would like to make a lot of money in religion, I'll tell you what to do. Uh, you need to find yourself a seminary that does not hold to inerrancy or final judgment that it's all the only outs in free. And you need to get you a degree, get you a couple of good suits and a Buick, not a Lexus. That's, you'll condemn you for that, but not a Ford either. All right. You need to just be beige and you tell people what they want to hear and you can make a living before you go to hell. And so let's continue right here. And so in verse 13, see you drop faith alone and you can preach anywhere to anybody and you will offend no one. You're just going to stroke them on how smart and good they are and they will purr like cats until they face the Almighty. And so verse 13. He says, it's no use keeping law because those who are circumcised, they don't even keep the law themselves. But they want to have you circumcised that they can boast in your flesh. Look at me. 
These guys become whitewashed tombs. You walk over them and you don't know they're dirty. They're just clean on the outside, but they are corrupted. Does Paul kind of beat around the bush right here? He doesn't. Uh, when you're talking about heaven and hell through one way, the portal of Christ, uh, you better be able to say it in about eight sentences. It better be clear. And so that's what Paul is doing. He said it at the beginning, then he explained it, and now he's screwing on that deal right at the end. That's a complete unit. And so he continues to write in verse 14, that to him works of the law and prestige meant nothing. May it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Meaning that when I get to heaven, I'm not going to say one word about how good I was. Did Paul have some material to boast about? Well, you've written 13 New Testament books. That ain't bad. Uh, you founded churches all the way from uh, uh, Antioch to Asia to Europe, Philippi, all the way down to Corinth. You've been to Rome. Good night. What a ministry. But he said, I'm silent before God. The only thing I will boast in is the cross. Look who died for me. Isn't that great? It's the great leveler of all humans. And so I will boast only in the cross. I remember Billy Graham, they said, asked him one time on an interview, when you get to heaven, what's the first thing you'll say to God? He said, I will say, why me? Why me? He had nothing to boast in but Christ. And so in verse 14, the world has been crucified to me. I want nothing of their applause anymore. I want nothing of their praise. I don't need anybody applauding me at the end of my life except God. The world has been crucified to me. But then he says, and I to the world. I have a good buddy named uh, Chuck Madden. He's been with Navigators for years and years and years. And he and I were visiting one time. I remember where it was. We were in Israel at Ein Herod. That is the stream that Gideon and his men drank from when they brought the water up to the lips. And we were there talking. And this verse came up. Chuck and I were talking. I will presume to boast of nothing except what Christ is. Oh, that's Romans 15. Uh, here. Except the cross through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Now, I remember Chuck saying, for the world to be crucified to you is one thing, that you don't need its praise anymore. But to say, I have been crucified to the world, he said, that's quite another thing. That means the world regards you as a criminal, that you're a bad guy. You remember in Egypt, Israel had increased, and Egypt was blessed because of Joseph, taking him through a famine. And a king arose which did not know the Lord, nor remember the work which he had done through, uh, through Joseph. Is that possible for a generation to arise that has no inkling of their biblical foundations? Yeah. And it said, all of a sudden, they said, let's act with wisdom and persecute these Jews and get rid of them. The worst thing that ever happened to our country are these believers in God. We got to get rid of them. That's what it means that you are crucified to the world, that the world regards you as an enemy. If anyone will come after me, let him take up his cross. Who dies on crosses? Criminals. And now you are seen as an enemy of the state. Uh, one communist once said that the ultimate goal of communism was for the last politician to be strangled on the guts of the last Christian, to get rid of them. They said of the apostle Paul, they said, this man is the scum of the earth and he is the dregs of all things, literally the off scourings, whenever you would wash off the sacrificial altar, 
all of the guts and residue was called the off scourings. That's what this Christian is. Paul said, we are fools for Christ's sake. A guy named Tertullus uh, appeared before the Roman uh, consul and appealed for the condemnation of Paul in the book of Acts. And Tertullus said, this man is a real pest. And he is a ringleader of the cult of the Nazarenes. That's how he saw Paul. And so, as Hebrew says, let us go to him outside the camp bearing his reproach. When he preached in Jerusalem, the crowd responded. Whenever he talked about that the gospel of Christ, that he had died and his forgiveness had now gone to the Gentile world to be saved by faith, they said, and I quote, such a man as this should not be allowed to live. You ever had that said to you? (laughs) Well, that's what was said to Paul. And so Chuck Madden said to me, as we were there in Israel, he said, to be crucified, for the world to be crucified to you is one thing, but for you to be dead to the world is another, that they regard you as an enemy, and we need to be rid of you. Uh, Is that belief system starting to rise in our secular culture? Secularism demands that there is no final truth, that everybody does what is right in their own eyes. You want to be a male or a female today? Oh, I'll be this. Are you heterosexual, homosexual? Today, I'm going to be this. Uh, What are you? Whatever I want to be. There's no final standard of truth. I am God. I make the rules. Okay. Now we're all living happy, happily ever after until a Christian shows up with a Bible in his hand and he says, thus saith the Lord. One of them has got to go. Secularism or that Christian or that sophomore in the history class has got to go. And so we're kind of like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego before the image. You bow or you die. And so now you and I are seen as those that are holding back the ongoing of a Darwinian model, of a Hegelian dialectic. You know what I'm talking about? Don't worry about it. That we're holding back the system. We ancient barbarians that hold to the notion of God. And so I have been crucified to the world and the world to me. And so, in verse 13, he continues. Like I say, in verse 15, he continues. Were y'all here last week when I couldn't find my mic and got to, it was a first service. I I came up and I looked for my mic and it wasn't here and I started screaming. I said, Kendall, where's my mic? And he came up and he went, here. (laughs) Hubble, okay. Am I getting old? No. About three weeks ago, I came into the church office yelling for my glasses. Where's my glasses? And Beverly Turner went, they're on your nose. Okay. I ain't old. Verse 15. He begins with the word for. This is why he will boast only in the cross, because neither is circumcision anything or uncircumcision. Religion and religious affectation, your hair, your beard, your sideburns that come down in ringlets, your costuming, your sacrificial system, your worship at the Ganges River. When we're talking about eternal life and in Christ, that's unmentionable. It has no place in grace, is works. Neither is circumcision anything or uncircumcision, but a new creation. In the old creation of Genesis 1, how much part did you play in the creation? Zero. You had nothing to say. God said, let there be, and there was. In the new creation of your salvation, how much did you have to do with it? Nothing. He became to us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. That as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not as a result of works, lest any single human being should boast. You will be silent before God. And so, neither is circumcision or anything nor uncircumcision, 
but it is the work of God by his word. That's it. What do we all have in common? We came from all different directions, but we all ended up at the cross of grace with empty hands. Amen? The thief came away saved. The, the executioner said this man is innocent. And the ladies who stood by weeping, John the apostle, Jesus' mother, they're all saved the same way, coming with empty hands to the cross of Christ. That's why today we celebrate communion. My body, my blood, your forgiveness. Never forget this. It's me. And so, a new creation. It goes like this. Whatever things were gained to me, these things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss. In view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, dung. It's the Greek word skubalon. Just sounds nasty, doesn't it? Kuon means a dog. We get the word canine. Balo means to throw. Skubalon means to throw it to the dogs. The stuff you don't want. And Paul said, that's why how I regard all that I used to be when it comes to salvation. I, could, I gave it up with no problem. What profiteth a man to gain the whole world, but you lose your soul? I, got, I said goodbye to it. And so in verse 16, those who will walk by this K-A-N-O-N, it is called a hapax lugomena. It's a term, not a word, he's used the word at times, but the idea of salvation by faith being a K-A-N-O-N, a cannon. Cannon means a straight rod, like on a cannon, the, uh, what's it, the barrel, that's a straight rod. Canonicity is the biblical idea of what is and what is not Bible. The books we regard as being Bible are the canon of the Old and New Testament. Uh, this is the word here, and it means a standard, an index. Those who will walk by, verse 15, the new creation, verse 14, the cross of Christ. This is a canon. It's a law given by the apostles at the Jerusalem Council. We believe that we are saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus, even as the rest. This is a canon. They said to Jesus, what must we do to work the works of God? This is the work of God, yeah, that you believe in him whom God has sent. It's a canon. Let me show you something. Keep your finger right here. Go three books to your left to Romans chapter 3 after Paul explains his proposition of the gospel. Romans 3 verse 21 through verse 26 is one sentence. It's a run-on sentence. And it's the greatest nouns pronouns, verbs that are mentioned anywhere in human language. And underneath it, after talking about faith alone saves, Paul in verse 27, in verse uh, 29, and in verse 31 asks three questions. And he means them to be answered. And he says in verse 27, where then is boasting? In light of salvation by faith, where can we hear one human being brag about how he is added to the salvation of God, about how God needed him to get him into heaven? Now, verse 27, where is boasting? It is, what's your word? Excluded. It's nowhere to be found. Why? By what kind of law? Of works? No. If you get into heaven by works, are you going to find a lot of guys chirping up and talking? You bet they are. That's why if you talk to a guy and you want to find out if he's Christian, you ask him the question. Number one, you say, have you come to the point to where you know that if you died now, you'd be with God in heaven? 
You listen to his answer. Most guys will say yes. Then you ask him the next question. If you did die and stand before God, and he said, why should I let you in? What would you say? That's called a diagnostic question. You have to know the answer. Now, if I go to one of y'all, or I should, and I say to you, you're going to be in heaven, you're going to say yes. If I say, why, why would God let you in? You're going to say one thing, because of Jesus, who became, lived the life I can't live and who died the death that I deserve, I should not be in heaven. And apart from him, I'm going straight to hell. No, I trusted in Christ back this, at this point. I put my faith in him. That's it. Amen. We have no confidence in the flesh. Verse 27, by what kind of law it works? No, but by the law of faith. And this is another hapax. Paul invents a term. It's hard to be Paul because you can't quote Paul. You know, it's easy for me to preach. I quote Paul. He don't get to quote Paul. He is Paul. So he invents Pauline terms. And so you're not saved by the law of Moses. You're saved by the law of faith. It's a law because there's no other way. And the law is that you put your trust in Christ. That's the canon. That's the Jerusalem council. We believe we're saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus, even as the rest. And this is Pauline. It is the law of faith. And he says now in verse 28, why does he call it a law? Because we, the apostles, and all Christianity maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. How clear do you want it? Incidentally, in an old Bible from way back, it says this, we maintain, we the apostles maintain, meaning that we will not relent to another answer. We maintain that a man is justified by faith alone. And that's where the, the Reformation watchword came from, sola fide. So it is the law of Christ, the law of faith. Go back here to verse 16. And so verse 16, those who will abide by or continue in this rule, those, plural pronoun, that church, those Christians that will walk by the rule of faith, peace and mercy be upon them. How does Paul begin his letters? Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. When you stand in the grace of God, you're at peace. I went and prayed with my brother Leon a couple of days ago. I knew he was going to be in glory, and I just held his hand. And I said, Leon, uh, you wait at the Eastern Gate. I'll be there directly. If you see my brother, tell him hi. Tell him he owes me $100. <laughs> he left before he got paid. But I'll be there with you. And you know what? Leon smiled. He had no worries. You know why? Because Leon believed the law of faith, the canon. And grace and mercy was his. And so when I do your funeral, and I know that you have trusted Christ, I'm going to go to get up and brag about you and talk about how you're in glory because there is grace and there is mercy to those who live by this rule. Same way with the church. When a church abides in faith alone, that's the first fundamental. The grace of God is exhibited. Uh, Mel and I at times when we started this church, you know, it was hard to grow because we didn't have a place families could come because we didn't have a building where you could have a place for kids. And we didn't have a building because we didn't have any money. We didn't have any money because we didn't have any families. And we didn't have any families because we didn't have a place for the build. And we didn't have a building because we didn't have any money. Didn't money. So it looked like a catch-22. We were never going to. We just said, look, and I would say to Mel, 
Are we holding the verbal plenary inspiration? Yes. Do we hold the salvation by faith alone? Yes. Are we maintaining the moral code of the New Testament? Are we compromising? No. Are we trying our best to get guys into discipleship and sharing their faith? Yes. Grace and mercy to those who walk by this canon. I believe that God is going to take care of us. And you know what he did? I still don't know how we got here. We just got a bunch of rich guys. That's the way we did it. We built a building. And so, mercy upon them. And then he says, and upon the Israel of God. The them is talking about the Gentiles, like the Galatians. And then to the Jew, no, not merely to the Jew, to the real Jew, the Israel of God. Did Abraham have another kid born of him that was not included in the promise? It's called Ishmael. His claim was physical birth from Abraham. John the Baptist said, don't claim to me that you are from Abraham. God can raise up from these stones, children of Abraham. You better be an Isaac born of the word and the grace and the faithfulness of God. A supernatural child born out of the sepulcher of uh, Sarah's womb, a work of God. And so that's what Paul calls the true Jew. We call it a completed Jew who is believed upon their Messiah. And so if you're a Jew, uh, the Bible cuts you no slack. You get saved the same as all of us by the law of faith. And so peace be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Verse 17, he says, don't hesitate in thinking I'm the real deal because I am. Don't wonder if I have grace and mercy bestowed because I do. You know why? Because I bear the mark of the Christian. What's that? Circumcision? No. He says in verse 17, let no one cause trouble for me because I bear on my body the brands of Jesus. What's the brand, the mark of Jesus? Paul says from now on, let no one cause trouble. This is after the first missionary journey where he was stoned. How does a man look after he has been stoned to death and then raised by God miraculously to rise up and say through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God? How do you do that? He was marked. Uh, Paul said five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Uh, three times I was beaten in rods. Once I was stoned a night and a day I've spent in the deep. He had the brands of Jesus. And that's what the mark is of the Christian. Have you suffered? In the Roman Empire, they would brand slaves. This is how we know that you belong to Jesus. You have suffered for the gospel. So don't anybody doubt my validity. I bear on my body the brands of Jesus. And the, and the Nicene Council in 325. 303, Christianity had become the official religion of the Roman Empire when Constantine declared it so. In 325, they had a dissension over whether Christ was a created being, an angel, or was he the eternal son of God? It's called the Arian heresy. And they gathered together 318 bishops, leaders of 318 metropolitan areas over the churches. Be like the Bishop of Dallas, the Bishop of Fort Worth. And they would come together and you had in a sense the whole church there. And so Constantine called the first ecumenical worldwide church council at Nicaea in Turkey. And he walked in because he felt that you couldn't have a united Roman Empire if you didn't have a united religion. So they had to all get along. And so he walked in to oversee this council. And he walked up to one of the bishops that had lost an eye put out, gouged out through the Diocletian persecution uh, of uh, earlier days. And he went up to that bishop and he took him by the face and he kissed the empty socket where his eye was gone, letting him know it was like a president bestowing the medal of honor on a man. You're the real deal. Give you another illustration. My son graduated from Fort Benning, Georgia, uh, in 
military. And me and my wife, my other son, John, my mother and Teresa's parents went to the graduation. And my father-in-law was in World War II in the South Pacific. And he had, a, like a lot of those guys in those days, he had a shoebox full of medals that he never wore. He just filed them away. And Teresa prevailed upon him to wear a medal on the army base. He hadn't been on an army base since 1945. So he said, okay, well, guess what medal he put on? Put on a purple heart. And we walked onto that base and Benjamin would introduce us to his commanding officers. And these military men would come up. This was about 1997, I guess. And they would come up and look at my father-in-law who had diabetes and he was starting to lose feeling in his feet and he walked with a cane. Very quiet man. But at Leyte Gulf, he got blown up. A bomb went off and he woke up in a foxhole in a guy's arms from Brooklyn. And the guy from Brooklyn was saying, you're dead, Newman, you're dead. And he said, he thought he was in hell. All right. <laughs> Yo, you're dead, Newman, you're dead. He said, no, I'm not, I'm alive. Ha! Ah! And he got up and he said he felt some kind of impingement. He couldn't move his arm. It's because he had a nine inch piece of shrapnel under his shoulder blade. And he got to walking and his shoes started squishing and it was his own blood. So they got him in, took it out, sewed him up, checked him for infection, and he went back out. And so that was his, among other things, that was his purple heart. If it had been a little bit one way or the other, he'd been dead. And so whenever he would, those men would see him, these captains and majors and the like, they would shake his hand and they would hold his hand. They just would hold it and look at him. And some of them would touch it and go, where were you? Leyte Gulf. Mm. Mm. That was ugly. It was real ugly. And they would just touch him and almost bow. So good to meet you, sir. They'd touch it. I'd say to him, you know, I played at North Texas for four years. <laughs> uh, <laughs> didn't you have a 2.3 in phys ed? Yes, I'm the one that you were there. Yeah, I sure do. Made a seven on a genetics test. That's exactly right. You know why they were so respectful? My father-in-law had the brand of a patriot. And that was a scar from combat. Well, in verse 18, he says, the grace of our love, verse 17, let no one cause trouble for me. Verse 18, circle the word, you, your spirit, me and you. He said, I bear on my body the brands, the grace of our Lord Jesus be with your spirit. Brethren, family, the old guys talking to the young guys. Y'all ever read the poem called Flanders Fields? In Flanders, it's about a World War I cemetery in Flanders. And in Flanders Fields, the poppies grow beneath the crosses, row on row, which marks our place. We are the dead. Short days ago, we loved, felt dawn, saw sunset grow, loved and were loved, and now we lay in Flanders fields. Take up our cause against the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high, and should ye break faith with we who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. This is Paul's Flanders fields. I have suffered. Grace be with your spirit, brethren. You've got to stand. This is important in our day. There's a guy named Henry Adams, and he was a church, he was a historian, and he made a statement once that if you were born in 1854, I don't know why I chose that day, he said the difference between a man born in 1854 and the year zero, philosophically speaking, was negligible that they both believed the same from 1854 to the year zero when Christ came. They assumed the same things on creation, God, 
the dignity of man, right, wrong, and the need of redemption. They have the same worldview. He said, if you were born, he said that guy born in 50, 1854, though he would be virtually eye to eye with the year zero, by the time 1900 came, a scant 50 plus years later, he said the man in 1900 had nothing in common with 1854. He said, and this was a great quote, Henry Adams said, before 1850, that's when essentially man took the place of God in what is known as secularism. Thank you, Karl Marx. Thank you, Charles Darwin. Thank you, Hegel, that saw everything not as static and final, but as ongoing and evolutionary. And so man became sovereign. And he said, before 1854, the church was the teacher, the world was the pupil. He said, after 1854, the church became the pupil and the world became the teacher. And the church has been learning ever since. Ain't that terrible? But it's a fact. And so in this day, more than any other time, the ethos of secularism, that there is no final truth, man invents his own sexuality, gender, truth, whatever he, there is no final right and wrong except that there is no right and wrong. You and I no longer are merely a part of it. That belief and you and I with a Bible and a cross and a savior cannot coexist. One of us has got to go. And that's why today the world sees us as Nebuchadnezzar did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If you will not bow, you will burn, but we will not coexist with you and your Jehovah saying that we are wrong. One of us is going. And so you and I now at more than any time in the last 150 years have to stand on the infinite self evident God that is known to all men, that is instinctive to all men, that there are self-evident truths of right and wrong and sexuality and what is unnatural, that they do not have to be debated. They are instinctive. Thirdly, that there is a Bible that is a revelation that is inerrant. And by this way, we know the God who is there and is not silent that this chief idea is Christ who lived and died and rose whereby men could be reoriented unto God. That man is saved by faith alone and that with that faith alone comes a, a rebirth and a regeneration and that someday the regenerator is coming back and there shall be final judgment. There shall be heaven and hell. You notice how Paul ends the letter in verse 18? What's the last word? Amen. He only does that with about three other epistles. And Paul says, done. This is what we believe. We are Christians. Let's remember the Lord. Father in heaven, we stop for just a few minutes and we remember that Jesus gave us the Lord's Supper, which obviously was a memorial that there would be nothing that would be salvific through a physical act, but he gives us something that we are to spiritualize and to think back deep in our hearts as we look at our mate's wedding ring and we think back at this sign when we have birthdays and we think back of when this life started when we have the 4th of July and we think back of when we were born out of the blood of patriots and communion or Passover, when we think back to when we came out of Egypt, the Jews did, through the blood of the Lamb. And so now we think back and we clear our throats, we dry our eyes and we remember, this is my body for you. This is my blood poured out for a new covenant to you to be in a, in a state of grace before God, not to be looking forward to anything, but to look back at the cross who came, to have a new nature, to be finished with law and to be open to grace because of the death of Jesus. 
That's why we have Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and Acts that tells of him and the epistles that describe him and Acts where he comes back and Genesis to Malachi that say he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. And we have come to know and have abide within us the very Holy Spirit of God that's given us joy and a new heart and a peace, very light and very soft in our, in our heart that speaks that we belong to him. And so we'll remember him now. In Jesus' name, amen.